Welcome, Seekers of the Undying Glow, to today's lesson covering some of the baddest weapons in the Fallout series, plasma weapons. Representing the peak of pre-war technology, plasma weapons remain extremely potent, albeit rare weapons in the wasteland, and are also some of my favorite weapons in the franchise, because of how good they are, and because of all the green. If you can't tell, I just love green, I can't help myself. So sit back and enjoy as we go over the plasma weapons of Fallout. Before we talk about individual weapons, I wanted to talk about plasma in general. Often called the fourth state of matter, it is comprised of ionized gas that is excited either through high temperatures, an electrical current, or electromagnetic waves. Since plasma is gas in an excited state, it is about as difficult to control as gas is, only more so due to the high temperatures. Plasmas will react to magnetic fields, however, and this is the method that plasma weapons in Fallout claim to use in order to send orderly bolts of plasma toward targets. Although, given the distances many engagements occur in, the mechanism that keeps the plasma bolts together is unknown, as our current understanding would mean that the plasma would quickly disperse once the magnetic confinement is weak enough. So with that out of the way, let's take a look at a staple of the Fallout series. Appearing in every Fallout game to date, the plasma rifle is an icon and always serves as a milestone for players who know they have entered into the late game when friend and foe alike start to arm themselves with this weapon. Fallout and Fallout 2 have the same plasma rifle that does not look much like what you may picture in your mind when you hear the word rifle. Being held much more like a heavy weapon with a forward top grip and a rear grip where the trigger likely is, the design of this weapon is very unique and unlike any other weapon design, including the plasma pistol, which one would initially assume would share some similarities since they are both plasma weapons. There are, what appear to be, large cylinders on top of the weapon, which could very well be the gas that is being turned into plasma, since they look nothing like the square boxy microfusion cells that are the ammo source. There's another possibility that whatever liquid or gas is contained in these cylinders is meant to help cool the weapon. It is hard to know the function of the structure at the tip of the barrel. It could be a way to focus the plasma at the last point before it leaves the weapon, and maybe the large flat fin-like structures are meant to help dissipate heat. Or maybe the developers just thought it looked freaking cool, there's no way to know. What I find really interesting about this weapon is that the official name is the Winchester Model P94 Plasma Rifle, meaning that good old Winchester was still in business up until the Great War, as plasma weapons were the cutting-edge technology of the pre-war. It also means that this is a completely pre-war design, and to be honest, it looks like something that a group like the Enclave would have created after years of research and development of the pre-war technology, of course. Fallout 2 has the exact same weapon, and in both games it is very much an endgame weapon that deals a massive amount of damage and is able to achieve over 200 damage on a critical hit. The green plasma emitted by the single-shot weapon has the capability of turning an enemy, or an unfortunate ally, into a puddle of goo. A modified version of the rifle, the Turbo Plasma Rifle, increases both damage and range once a normal plasma rifle is hot-wired to accelerate the bolt formation process. This weapon even shaves off one action point in Fallout 1, although Fallout 2 takes it back to 5, which is where the original plasma rifle sits. This hot-wiring can be done by Smitty in the first Fallout game, remember this guy, who will take a plasma rifle from your inventory and hotwire it after helping to fix some hydroponic farms. Fallout 2 has a few people, like Algernon and Nurino, who can also perform the modification. One would think the modification would come with some downside, like increased microfusion consumption or increased AP, but it only comes with advantages, making this a worthy upgrade in every sense. The appearance also changes a little with a different top grip and the cylinders looking a lot different and oriented lengthwise with the weapon. Perhaps the modification necessitated changing out some parts to deal with greater temperatures, voltages, or pressures involved with hot wiring, or maybe the weapon needs more of whatever is in those cylinders, which are never swapped out or topped off in any way. It is interesting to note that in the Fallout demo, the plasma rifle was originally called the Plasma Caster, and in Fallout 3, Elder Lions references the P94 plasma rifle specifically, although the plasma rifles in Fallout 3 are completely different and bear no resemblance to the Fallout or Fallout 2 plasma rifle. 
I don't know what the possible design inspiration is, but the weapon description does state it is an industrial grade weapon. And I can't shake the feeling that this weapon started out life as some sort of plasma tool like a plasma cutter or welder and it was turned into a weapon. Fallout Tactics has a plasma rifle that has a resemblance to the Fallout and Fallout 2 plasma rifles, particularly for the barrel and finned portion at the end of the barrel. However, it has been changed rather significantly to a conventional rifle layout with a stock, pistol grip, and what may be where the microfusion cells are loaded or maybe it's just a front grip. Tanks are installed on top under what are probably rear sights and may have functioned as a carrying handle. The design reminds me quite a bit of the Heckler & Koch G36, although there are some rather distinct differences, other than the obvious like the barrel that is a carryover from the Fallout 2 plasma rifle. The in-game description also calls this weapon the P94 plasma rifle, which is just an error on the part of the game as they seem to copy over many weapon descriptions from Fallout 2 word for word even when the weapons themselves were vastly different looking. If I were to justify this within lore, I would probably say that this is a later model, after they were able to get the technology small and light enough to put in a conventional weapon layout, whereas the previous plasma rifle was an earlier model, but there is no actual evidence for this. It is almost exactly the same as the previous plasma rifle in regards to damage, weight, and action point cost. Like many things in the Fallout universe, Fallout Brotherhood of Steel decides to give the established games the big fat middle finger and do its own thing. The electric plasma rifle goes from being a viable endgame weapon to an early to mid game weapon, from microfusion cells to heavy energy cells, and a completely new design that deals electrical damage? Taking design cues from 50s and 60s era sci-fi ray guns, it is difficult to determine where energy cells are even loaded into the weapon, as it is a very slim and minimalistic design. It deals electrical burn damage with an area of effect and can be charged for 3 energy cells worth of energy to be released in one shot. I'm curious as to why this isn't just an electrical gun of some sort, unless it is using the plasma as a conductive conduit to the target, but there are more effective ways of accomplishing that task like using a laser similar to the Laser Assisted Electrical Rifle or LAER in New Vegas. There is also the Turbo Plasma Rifle that is substantially larger and with a layout more akin to heavy weapons with an overhead forward grip. This operates similarly with increased damage and is a solid endgame weapon, offset only by a slightly lower rate of fire. Fallout 3 brings the microfusion cells back and makes the plasma rifle an endgame weapon again. However, the design is once again extremely different from anything we have seen before. Just like earlier fallouts, the weapon fires a green plasma bolt. The speed of the plasma bolt is slower than any other weapon in the game meaning that medium to long range shots have a good chance of missing a moving target unless the player compensates. The design itself is very interesting and unique, and I could not find anything real or fictional that might have served as a design inspiration, but if you have any ideas, please leave a comment and I will feature it in my comment highlight. The unique variant, A321's plasma rifle, is obtained from Harkness in Rivet City who, unbeknownst to him, is a synth who ran away from the institute and had his memory wiped. This unique weapon is superior to the standard plasma rifle with higher damage, critical damage, critical multiplier, and weapon HP. It is interesting that a synth was armed with this weapon, as in Fallout 4, we only ever see synths, including the Coursers, use the institute laser rifles. However, a legendary plasma rifle can be bought at the institute perhaps meaning they have iterated on the base plasma rifle and made improvements. At any rate, the name of this version of the plasma rifle is unknown. However, we can assume that this was a pre-war design because a unique version in Fallout New Vegas with the overall same design was being worked on by Repcon, the details of which we will cover in just a second. Fallout New Vegas nerfs the plasma rifle a bit by lowering the DPS and causing it to consume two cells per shot rather than one. Otherwise, it has the same model and does not differ from Fallout 3 except that it has a modification that it can be fitted with, called the Plasma Rifle Magnetic Accelerator. This has small coil-like components and fits over the glass bulb at the end of the weapon, likely using magnetic fields to help propel the bolt to higher velocities and results in a 200% increase in bolt speed, which definitely makes this upgrade worth it. Plus, it looks pretty sweet, which we know is the most important part. The Van Graaff's Plasma Rifle is a unique variant that is inferior to the standard plasma weapon in most ways, most notably inflicting much less damage. 
The only benefit to this weapon is that it does not have the 25 point energy skill requirement to use effectively, that the other plasma rifles do. So it looks like the Van Graaff sold out and dumbed down the rifle for casuals. The Q35 Matter Modulator is another unique rifle being developed by Repcon as part of an army research program that was won from Poseidon Energy when they failed to produce an effective new plasma rifle to replace the P94 Winchester plasma rifle featured in the first fallouts. More than that though, Repcon was able to steal the most recent research designs from Poseidon, which eventually evolved into the Q35. This also means that the plasma rifle in Fallout 3 and Fallout New Vegas was probably developed by Poseidon and tweaked by Repcon, although it is also possible that the initial Poseidon blueprints were changed enough by Repcon that they can claim to be the true inventors of the Fallout 3 and New Vegas plasma rifles. The full name of this weapon is the Quantum Plasma Modulation Matter Injection Rifle, version 35, or as I like to call it, the Kpmerv 35. Although it has lower damage per shot than the standard plasma rifle, it has a higher fire rate, critical damage, and lower AP and weight, making it an all-around better weapon. Visually, it has a much different color scheme, red and black, which somehow extends to the microfusion cells, being a different color as well, which doesn't seem right. It also has extra hardware with more of the injector or capacitor looking components, but it unfortunately cannot take the magnetic accelerator mod from the original plasma rifle. Like the name implies, it was the 35th iteration on failed prototypes and finally worked as intended. However, it was not made from particularly durable material since it was just a test bed and not meant for active field use. In a great display of irony, there were plans from Poseidon and the Repcon CFO to steal the Q35 while it was being transported, but the Great War put an end to those plans. The name is a reference to Marvin the Martian who attempts to use weapons like the Uranium Q36 Explosive Space Modulator to unsuccessfully destroy Earth. The Multiplaz Rifle is another New Vegas variant that is longer and consumes more rounds per fusion cell. However, it also fires three bolts of plasma and is to the plasma rifle as the tri-beam laser rifle is to the normal laser rifle. It also has extra components on the model, likely to help meet the increased power and cooling requirements involved with firing three bolts of plasma at once. Unfortunately, we know nothing about the backstory or development of this weapon, although it is not unique and can be found in a handful of locations like Deathclaw Promontory next to some remnant power armor. There are two developer plasma weapons, the Plasma Rifle Always Crit and Plasma Rifle Weak, that are exactly like the name describes. These can only be obtained via console commands and once dropped out of inventory cannot be picked back up by the player, so make sure you hold on to that weak plasma rifle that does an incredible 3 damage. Fallout 4 and 76 redesigned the plasma rifle model, as well as making it so modular that there is no dedicated plasma pistol or plasma rifle like with ballistic weapons. While the laser weapon shares the same fate, it does mean that there are many ways to customize the plasma weapons outside of just a rifle, pistol, or a caster. Other than looking a little bit different, it still has distinctive elements that make it very recognizable for those that have played the previous 3D games. Fallout 4 and 76 also move away from microfusion cells being the ammunition type for plasma weapons and introduce the plasma cartridge. While I have mixed feelings about this because it is a retcon, I also think the plasma cartridges make more sense as we can see that there is a green cylinder that houses the substance that is to be turned into plasma as well as a battery component which makes a lot more sense than previous plasma weapons. There are a ton of upgrades that boost damage, rate of fire, and a number of other things. However, I think the most interesting are the modifications that drastically change how the plasma weapon can be used. Most notably, there is a splitter barrel modification that makes a shotgun-like plasma weapon, a flamer barrel modification that makes it similar to a flamethrower, and a sniper barrel that focuses the bolt so much that it can become a viable long-range weapon. The plasma bolts are still slower than all other weapon types, although they are not as slow as Fallout 3 and New Vegas. Due to the slow projectile speed and the reworked critical hit mechanics of Fallout 4 and 76, bolts can sometimes defy physics and fly around objects and corners to hit targets, like this is some sort of sci-fi Adam Punk wanted movie. It is also interesting to note that because the plasma weapons are so light, in fact some of the lightest weapons in the game, if plasma cartridges are not a problem then it can make a vastly superior flamer when compared to the conventional flamer. 
The low weight and high damage of these weapons also means that it is a very good weapon for Fallout 4 survival. Fallout 4 has a few legendaries, including Experiment 18A, which can be bought in the Institute with the rapid legendary effect. I think this is interesting because it shows that the Institute is, or maybe was, doing active research on plasma weapons. Why this research seems to have stopped is truly puzzling as plasma weapons are vastly superior weapons to the Institute laser weapons. Heck, the rocks kids throw at you in Fallout and Fallout 2 are superior weapons to the Institute laser rifles. The best I can figure is that with their limited industrial capacity, they may not have been able to produce the plasma cartridges as easily or in the numbers required when compared to microfusion cells. I don't know guys, I'm trying, okay? The Sentinel's Plasma Caster is a legendary that can be bought from the Brotherhood of Steel with the instigating effect. I find it interesting that this is called a Plasma Caster when there exists such a weapon in a much different form that will be coming up in a later video. Fallout 76 has a few unique variants including Mind Over Matter which can be obtained during the field testing quest and is a 3 star legendary that will have increased damage against ghouls, increased damage when aiming, and increased damage resistance while aiming. Slug Buster can be obtained during the Buried Treasure quest and when it is a 3 star legendary will ignore 50% of the armor, increase critical shot damage by 50%, have a 90% reduction in weight, and has a hidden effect that causes it to use 20% less AP. The Enclave Plasma Weapon was one improved by the Enclave, resulting in higher damage and also changing the look a bit. Now it is more silver and the see-through portions are now opaque. There are not as many mods available for this Plasma Weapon since only one can be learned and a good number that exist in the game files are not implemented in the game. It is interesting to note in Fallout 4 and 76 that when a critical is performed on an enemy, they are reduced to green goo, and there is a chance that they will drop nuclear material when this happens, which has some very interesting implications for the gooification of enemies. And yes, gooification is a scientific term. In a never-ending effort to overachieve, Fallout New Vegas has the most kinds of plasma weapons of any game. This includes the Plasma Defender, which is only found in Fallout New Vegas. It is radically different from the Plasma Pistol, which is the most comparable weapon in the whole game, and looks nothing like any of the other Plasma weapons. Or does it? That's called foreshadowing, by the way. Looking far more conventional, it has a few visual quirks including a green window that the concept art shows as some sort of output screen showing waves, but in game it is just green with no distinguishing features like the end of the barrel. It does however flash an orange-yellow color when firing, just like the end of the barrel so maybe it is a transparent window to see the substance that gets excited into plasma. The Defender also offers superior damage and DPS to the plasma pistol, while also being more accurate and using fewer action points. On the flip side, it consumes energy cells at twice the rate of the plasma pistol and has reduced durability. Arcade Ganon uses a Plasma Defender that cannot be equipped by the player, and there's also a Gunrunner's Arsenal version of the Defender whose only difference is that it can accept mods. It can get a scope, a sheath stabilizer that reduces spread, and a high capacity terminal that increases the ammunition capacity. Or I guess the number of shots from a single pack of duct tape AA batteries. I mean energy cells. An interesting note is that this weapon, for some reason, is not on a number of leveled item lists in the game that determine when vendors or spawn points will allow certain weapons to be available, meaning it cannot be bought from vendors, and the only one that can be obtained at a vendor location is at the Silver Rush as a display piece on a table. Since we just talked about the Plasma Defender, let's talk about its sibling, the Plasma Pistol. The Plasma Pistol is found in every single game except Brotherhood of Steel, which is the Fallout community still claiming that game? Anyway, the Plasma Pistol from Fallout and Fallout 2 is shown here, and, uh, wait, what? Alright, apparently it is almost an exact match to the Plasma Defender with the Scope mod. Looks like good old Obsidian pulled a fast one on us. So the Plasma Pistol of Fallout and Fallout 2 looks identical to the Defender, and all the Plasma Pistols of the later Fallouts look nothing like the original Plasma Pistol even though they share the same name. So I'm going to need to hear all the justification and spin you guys can muster to make this congruent with Fallout lore. It was apparently produced by Glock and is known as the Glock 86. Not only that, it was engineered by the Gaston Glock Artificial Intelligence which takes us to a whole new level of weird. Gaston Glock was the engineer who founded the Glock company in both our world and Fallouts. 
and apparently his mind was uploaded to an AI that was still churning out weapon designs. This is a solid early to mid game weapon, although it loses out to the plasma rifle in terms of raw damage. Algernon at New Reno Arms can modify the pistol to have its magnetic housing chamber realigned, doubling its ammo capacity due to increased efficiency. It is interesting to think that every single plasma pistol out there has the magnetic housing chamber misaligned by the time Fallout 2 takes place. Way to go, Gaston. Fallout Tactics also has the plasma pistol and it looks the same as in Fallout and Fallout 2 and once again has the exact same description. Its damage output makes it a solid mid-game weapon especially for those with pistol builds. Fallout 3's plasma pistol is a drastic departure from earlier designs, indicating that it has an altogether different development and origin. It is close in style to the plasma rifle that we covered earlier and is most often seen being carried by Enclave officers. Although we don't know the exact backstory, we know the design is pre-war in origin, but you will have to wait to know exactly how we know that. We do know that the Enclave developed the MPLX Nova Surge, which is the unique plasma pistol in Fallout 3. And I'm giving the Enclave's marketing department an A plus for that weapon name. This weapon has an interesting history that starts 14 years before the Great War and ends miles above the Earth in an alien ship. Dr. Aldwin Morley was a member of the Enclave and had been developing a prototype of the plasma pistol 14 years before the Great War, which resulted in a much more powerful design. While attempting to increase stabilization and reduce weight, Dr. Morley became aware of the existence of a group known as Quere Virum, which was a small group dedicated to exposing what they believed to be the government's massive cover-up of alien contact. Dr. Morley approached the group and offered assistance, letting them know where they could steal the prototype plasma pistol, which would serve as their proof that the government knew aliens existed and were using their technology in secret. Once the Nova Surge had been stolen, the Enclave pounced and killed all members of the group, but not before the last member could put the pistol in a safe that was hooked up to a terminal that was supposed to ensure that no one could easily break into the safe and steal it. This last man standing, Reed Underwood, sought to hide the safe away underground in the desert so that hopefully at some point in the future it would be uncovered as he accepted his inevitable fate. He was right on two counts. He did end up killed, and the weapon was discovered, just not by humans. The safe was taken up into Mothership Zeta, where it sits in a pile of human items that have been taken by aliens. If there was any proof of his claims that plasma weaponry was derived from alien tech, the fact that aliens sought it out in the desert and recovered it is probably the best evidence Fallout has given so far. After all, why else would they go to such effort to recover this specific pistol? That is the end of story time, but it is important to mention that the Nova Surge does three times the damage and has a higher critical multiplier, as well as the cost of increased energy consumption and a heavier weight. In Fallout New Vegas, the plasma pistol is identical aesthetically and very similar stat-wise to the Fallout 3 weapon. It can be used as a holdout weapon with a sneak of 50 or higher, prompting casino security to wonder if you've got a plasma pistol in your pants, or you're just happy to see Benny. Or both. There is a Gunrunner's version of the plasma pistol which is identical to the base pistol except it accepts modifications. The high energy ionizer increases damage by 7, the magnetic accelerator increases the bolt speed by times 2, and the recycler will replenish one round for every 4 shots fired. But careful holstering that bad boy. Fallout 4 and 76 are so modular that I covered really all the options in the section on plasma rifles. Having a shorter barrel and no stock will make the plasma gun in these games a de facto pistol. Fallout Brotherhood of Steel, the gift that keeps on giving, has another plasma-based weapon up its sleeve. The Electrical Plasma Cannon is a very large and questionable looking shoulder-mounted weapon that is arguably the best in the game. Enemies when hit will be electrocuted for 5 seconds and it can be charged for the equivalent of 3 normal shots to fire all in one go. Consuming 5 heavy energy cells per shot, once again we have an interesting case of a plasma weapon dealing electrical damage, which once again, I contend makes no frickin' sense. It takes a good deal of energy to create plasma, be it either through heat, electricity, or electromagnetic waves, and creating plasma and then producing electricity from that plasma is like heating a pot of water so the steam from that pot can heat a pan to cook your food. Alright, I'm done here. The plasma caster is an interesting weapon that was introduced in Fallout New Vegas and then appears again in Fallout 76. 
What makes it interesting is that this is the exact same weapon as the so-called Winchester P94 Plasma Rifle from Fallout and Fallout 2. What makes this renaming more appropriate than the Plasma Pistol becoming the Plasma Defender is that the Plasma Rifle in the original Fallouts has documentation suggesting it was originally meant to be called a Plasma Caster rather than a Plasma Rifle, which honestly makes more sense because rifles are meant to be fired from the shoulder among a few other things. It has small differences like the orientation and number of cylinders on top, as well as a prominent rear joystick like grip that has the trigger and a different overhand front grip. It is superior to the plasma rifle in terms of damage and microfusion cell consumption, but is a lot heavier and much less durable. That coupled with the rarity of the weapon can make it difficult to keep in good repair. It has one modification, the high speed electrode, which increases the rate of fire by 25% and has one unique variant, the Smitty Special. If you recall from the first section on the plasma rifle, Smitty was the NPC who would upgrade the player's plasma rifle to the turbo plasma rifle when completing a quest. Smitty's special was added with the gun runner's arsenal and has a very different look with a shorter barrel, larger fins on the end, and other added components like this yellow doohickey. Although it has lower damage and critical chances, it has a higher rate of fire and is fully automatic while also benefiting from increased ammo capacity and durability. Interestingly, this weapon has unique sounds, but they are not implemented in vanilla New Vegas, and the weapon simply reuses the Tesla cannon sounds. The Silver Rush where it can be bought is across the street from a building with a sign that reads Smitty's. So while it's apparent that it is connected to Smitty from Fallout 2 in some way, most likely just being a modified version of the plasma caster that he made himself or was made by whatever gunsmith or technology business that he set up, just looking at it, it is obvious it is a complete redesign. It would have been really cool to get even a few lines of dialogue to flesh out the background of this weapon and its origins a bit more. A few small details about the caster in general, there's only one that has a fixed location in game. All others may or may not be found in others inventory and when holstered with some armors it can cause the weapon to disappear, which is a feature that Fallout 4 mastered. Fallout 76 also has a plasma caster with a normal appearance looking very close to the New Vegas version. The weapon has a high rate of fire but is stymied by the small magazine. However, it is still a very powerful weapon. Modifications can only be bought from the vendor regs and the player can start to receive plasma casters as rewards from events once the plan is known to the player. Among these mods are different color schemes as well as barrel tips, although I have to say that I like the original design the best. I also think it is awesome that Fallout 76 is bringing back weapons from earlier Fallouts. Fallout 76 isn't done with the heavy hitting plasma weapons as we have arguably the best one yet to cover. The Gatling Plasma is one chunky boy that looks like a portable jet engine. The entire front assembly spins and the fin-like components can retract as well, exposing the only green portions of the entire weapon, which is honestly really surprising since plasma weapons have often been lit up like a Christmas tree in previous games. This weapon uses plasma cords as ammunition, which is a new ammunition type that for some reason in the menus looks identical to fusion cores but in game has a distinct look. The plasma cores have the green substance similar to the plasma cartridge as well as some copper parts that give the impression that a lot of current is meant to flow through the core, although no part of this looks like a battery. It can be purchased from MODIS in the White Springs Bunker Armory as well as from government airdrops at sufficiently high levels. I hope this is a weapon that will make a reappearance in newer Fallout titles because I can always use more plasma in my life. That is it for this video. Even though I left out a couple plasma based weapons like grenades and mines, and at least one melee weapon, I decided to have those feature in different lists like future videos on explosives and the final melee video that I completely forgot I had planned to do. You will want to make sure to watch the third melee video though when it comes out because all the weapons that don't fit into nice categories will be featured and there are some weird things you can beat people to death with. You can't leave just yet though, because we must go on to the comment highlights of my last video that explored what happened to the US military after the Great War. The ever vigilant Pignisman 7 reminded me that I left out mention of a small group of army soldiers that can be encountered when siding with the settlers during the Wastelanders main quest in Fallout 76. Having served time on the front lines of the Sino-American War, they were part of the security team that helped protect gold from Fort Knox to Vault 79, but found themselves shut out of the vault when the bombs fell. They left Appalachia and found themselves at the pit where they tried to free slaves but were unsuccessful. 
They eventually came back to Appalachia on word that it was safe again and monitored the settlers, eventually deciding to help should the vault dweller choose to help the settlers. Several of you agreed that the Gobi campaign, being a separate engagement from the Sino-American War, made the most sense, and I am certainly glad I'm not the only one. Most thought that a small U.S. presence of special forces that helped resistance to Chinese expansion, similar to U.S. actions taken in various Middle Eastern countries, was a likely scenario, and I absolutely agree. Thinking of the campaign in terms of another front in the Sino-American War makes less sense than an engagement with limited U.S. forces that happened prior to the Sino-American War. Hopefully we can get some extra lore on this in the future. MJH is an apiary biologist and left a very enlightening comment, or really a series of comments, in regards to the hereditary biology of intelligent death claws. I can't summarize it all here, so check out their comment which I have pinned in the comment section. And thanks to MJH for taking the time to drop that knowledge bomb for us. After reading through the comments, I don't see the mystery of how the death claw genetic inheritance works being solved anytime soon. Several of you responded to my comments on the Philippines and how we know of at least one spot where American forces were fighting communist forces. Blake Stone talks about how it could be a reference to the real world New People's Army, as they are the armed wing of the Communist Party of the Philippines, who are known for acts of terror. The fighting there could very well be Fallout's version of this group, since it isn't actually stated that the American forces are fighting Chinese soldiers, just that they are fighting communists. A few of you also corrected my mistake of saying Bar Harbor was in Massachusetts, it is part of the great state of Maine. An enclave remnant reminded me that I forgot about Camp Navarro in Fallout 2 that was turned into an enclave military base, and that is a great catch. Navarro was the site of a Poseidon energy refinery as well as an adjacent military base. After the Great War, at an unknown time, the Enclave repurposed the military base to fit their needs of vertebrate refueling and used it as a jumping off point for their operations on the mainland. We know by 2242 that the base still isn't fully staffed, indicating that the base was established not long before. The base would later be destroyed by the NCR and any surviving Enclave remnants had to flee and start life anew. Alan Lane reminded me that I did not mention the Yangtze campaign, which was mentioned by Dick Richardson, the Enclave president in Fallout 2, as well as the Yangtze memorial in New Vegas. I had assumed this campaign had to do with fighting going on in and around Shanghai and Nanjing, although I neglected to say so in my video. The main reason for this assumption is that the Yangtze River empties into the Pacific exactly in this region, and we already knew of fighting that had gone on there from multiple sources and games. I did a little bit of research and it seems there is no definite answer as far as where this campaign supposedly took place, but I'm going to continue to assume that the Yangtze campaign and the fighting in and around Shanghai are one and the same. If someone has some lore that states otherwise, please share it in the comments. That is it. Thank you all for your engagement and your comments. I love to see you interacting directly with me, as well as each other. Stay safe, take care of yourselves, and may Adam guide your paths.